welcome to episode 70 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. I'm Dave Kaloran in Napa Valley. And this is John Dinning in Los Angeles. John, the election continues on. How do you feel about that? Uh, I don't know. I feel like I'm in uh, just this hurricane that continues to spin me around. It feels like I'm in a washing machine or something. Ups and downs and side to side. You know, I feel like that our song choice is actually perfectly reflective of what this has turned and it appears to be turning into. Yeah, you just want to get that out of the way before we do drinks? Yes. It's a classic song by the Beatles from their 1970 album, Let It Be, and it is the long and winding road. (laughs) So perfectly evocative of what I fear could be a long process here and was the one thing I really didn't want to see happen, which was a disputed type of outcome, although it certainly seems to be trending in one direction at this point. Both the disputing and the (laughs) outcome. Yeah, one side's disputing, the other side seems to have gained the upper hand in terms of the voting outcome. So hopefully the next time we do a recording, or even before the LSAT this weekend, we'll have an answer on who the next president of this country will be. We'll see. I tried to behave myself and not pay too much attention to it yesterday. Uh, but if you hear me yawn halfway through this, that'll tell you how successful I was. I was up till about five in the morning watching <laughs> states fluctuate in color. I was past midnight on it. I find it fascinating watching the you know the machinations of the whole process. So it was a little bit more peaceful than uh, I thought it might be, and that was actually I thought very positive. So there was no riots that I was aware of, and and at least today there wasn't any storming protests and. That's amazing that we would say that's a victory in and of itself, but it certainly feels that way to me. Yeah. I used the phrase hurricane before. I hope we're just not in the eye of it. Uh, (laughs) We'll see what what all this turns into. Um, The good news is you and I both have a cocktail. Or at least I have a cocktail and you have a drink. Yes, you have a cocktail. What are you drinking? Uh, Well, pour one out once again. I feel like we've had a lot of pour out episodes (laughs) in 2020. Um, I'm drinking in honor of 007 himself, Sean Connery. And at this point, it should be pretty predictable. I'm drinking a vodka martini, Belvedere martini. Um, I'd say shaken, not stirred, but I'm sure it's going to be a bit of both. I shook it first, and now I'm stirring it. You know, I'm not a martini drinker, so I am not drinking a martini or anything 007 related. But I do have a question for you, because you do drink these kinds of things. Is there an actual difference between shaken and stirred? Not for vodka that I'm aware of. People who know more about this than I do, or at least pretend to, I would tell you that you can bruise gin if you shake it too vigorously. (laughs) Okay. That's what they say. Seems like an affectation to me. Oh, it's totally an affectation. (laughs) Speaking of (laughs) mostly affectation, um, you enophile, what are you drinking? Uh, I am drinking wine tonight. (laughs) And in fact, wine that... um, I have made and been involved in. This is a 2017 fence post Syrah, and that is from Alder Springs, which is up in Mendocino, north of Napa. And if you like red wines that have some power and muscularity, this is the kind of wine that you would like. It's one of my favorites. We made some really good wines in 2017 that are, I think, right in a a great period of drinking. Both our Cabernet (laughs) and Syrah are really good, but I just... You mean 2020? Did not 2020 make one. just a good period for drinking? I'll, I'll, 2020 is a great time That's for drinking. <laughs> uh, but I will say this, um, 2020 is not a vintage that I would spend a lot of time drinking or looking for in California because of the smoke problems. Right, the fires. Yeah, yeah 2017 was also a fire year down here. And um, we were very fortunate. This particular wine I'm drinking tonight didn't get any smoke near it. This was much more of a Napa Valley problem. And what happens is, if you're not familiar with smoke tank, when it gets on the wines, it produces a bitter flavor. And it can come out at any point. It might come out almost immediately. It might come out five years later. And so they can test for it chemically, but they can't always tell if it's going to be there. Sometimes it's so trace. So in 2020, we didn't make any wine. It's the first time in uh, a number of years we haven't done that, which to me is disappointing. But that's all right. That's just the way that it is. I feel worse for other people. Yeah, fencepost-wines.com. I can't recommend them enough. In fact, I need to restock. I'm fresh out down here. You pay full price. I figured as much. I'm surprised you're not charging me a premium. <laughs> pay you extra. That's Tripping right. Tripping to Denning's house, $100 a bottle extra. <laughs> I was thinking as you, you launched into that, that as, as little as I know or as much as I don't know about vodka martinis, 
Take the absolute inverse of that, and that's how much you do know about wine. I've learned a lot, I will say that. But it's, it's, there's so many variations, so many different yeah. types of grapes. It's just there's so many choices you can make. It's unbelievable how you can actually influence the outcome. So either way, that's what I'm drinking. It is good. If you like Syrah, there's a ton of great Syrahs out there, and uh, I recommend exploring it because it's a fun, fairly alcoholic wine. This is 14.8%. Not bad, so, man. Syrah's kind of sweet, right? I wouldn't say it's sweet. It's often described as spicy. Oh. It's a little bit racy. This has a slight blueberry note on it, and I love blueberry and wine, so um, it's all I'm all about it. I like it. Mine's more like mm, red. That's <laughs> as far as I go. My wife often says yeah. that to me. I was like, "You want to drink something wine tonight?" She's like, "Yeah." I said, "What do you want?" And I'm like, "Don't say red. Don't, don't say a color." <laughs> It's a joke now with us. Let's move on from the wine world right. and uh, the 007 world and move to the LSAT world. What's been going on there? Well, we had a big week um, for essentially people getting registered. And this was the subject of our last podcast, in fact, about picking test times and test dates for the upcoming November LSAT. So I think the biggest current event in the LSAT world is that the biggest test of the year and the last test of 2020 starts this coming weekend and runs through the following four, five days. Five days or so. Yeah. Maybe through Friday, even depending if they have to do makeup tests, but we'll see about that. I'm under the impression at this point that Friday is basically a given. Yeah, it has yeah. been. So, yeah, that's coming up. For anybody listening to this in the, the days leading into November, number one, I hope you've picked a time that you're happy with and the last podcast helped you out. Number two, we're wishing you luck. But number three, I think what we're going to cover today is actually going to be of some use as well. Yes. And I'll also remind everybody that we will, as usual, be around on all the major test days that are coming up, seeing what's going on. We'll recap it after this exam is over. But uh, feel free to see what's happening on Twitter or our forum or what have you, where we typically are interacting with students, and usually trying to celebrate, you know, the feel good that they come out with, but mm -hmm. sometimes trying to help people to get through what might not have been the best experience. So hopefully it's more of the former and none of the latter. And even a bit of psychiatry in the days leading right up to a test. I mean, anyone taking the test on, say, like Tuesday or Wednesday spends what is a fairly anxious weekend leading into it, often in touch with us, too. So... Indeed. And after that, the next LSAT is actually in January. It is mm -hmm. January 16th and 17th, just a Saturday and Sunday test. You still have some time to register for that. That comes up. Uh, the deadline is December 2nd, so about a month or so from the time of this particular recording. And yeah, let me let me add one more piece to that. You may have been just about to, and I stole your thunder. Um, but I have no problem. <laughs> I talked to a couple of students, some of whom are, are my own students, who've been in something of a rush to get signed up for January, or almost like a just default to January if they're not sure about November. There is going to be a gap of time between when these November scores release and when that January registration deadline hits. You've got about a little over a week. So if you're not sure about January, but you're taking November, you will actually have your November results in hand before you need to sign up. And that is a huge benefit. And I was not going to make that point, but hey. this is the benefit when you've got LSATs spread out over two months as opposed to month after month after month. You can get your scores back, make a determination if you need to take the next test, and then sign up. And that is yeah. exactly what January test takers will have the ability to do, assuming that you have an LSAT writing on file and you get that done in time, if not. Bang that drum. Yeah, man. Keep on top of that. Get it done as soon as possible. Uh, hopefully, if you haven't taken it yet, you plan to take it almost immediately, uh, sometime this week or right as the test you know, has finished for you. That would be a great decision. Just get it out of the way because you never know when there's going to be delays. But the interesting thing, John, is the point I was going to make was that whether you're taking November or January or even one of the later LSATs all the way out to April, yeah, February, we just April. did a crystal ball webinar on this past Monday night, probably the longest one I recall doing. It was a solid hour and a half of us talking about what we expected to see on this test. And then I just opened the mic and took questions for a while afterwards. Yeah, I was going to say, don't sell yourself short at 90 minutes. Because even though the recording ended, <laughs> we did not, you in particular did not, you stayed on the mic for at least another half hour just yeah. answering individual questions at the end of that. 
I just went on a tear. Well, again, dare we say that's the benefit of being live in these things. A lot of people sign up for the, the webinars knowing they're going to get a link to the recording and they watch that. And that's great. And I get it. But showing up live, you get a little extra Dave for your money. <laughs> I'm not sure everybody would agree that's a great thing. Well, it was free. <laughs> <laughs> Something, you know, complain or your money back. You get what you paid for. Yeah. Well, either way, we have posted the sound processed version of that crystal ball. So the sound was locally recorded. It sounds really good. Uh, on our blog. So you can go to the PowerScore LSAT blog. And if you want to listen to that, we talk about what we expect to see in the typical logical reasoning section, reading comp, logic games. We also got very specific about what prep test era to study from, as well as some pretty specific predictions as to exams we might see this November or January or later as well. So I think we're probably spot on with that. Time will tell. If it isn't J November that uh, one of those tests shows up, it's going to be January, in my opinion. So it's something you can listen to. might help put you in the right mindset. And if you're totally or somewhat uncertain about what to study, that is definitely the right thing to listen to because that's the whole point of it is to give you guidance on what to look for. Yeah, final point to that, because I've been asked twice today already by people, <laughs> we are not planning to do another one, um, at least for the next several months, probably not before April, because that one was designed to apply to all of the tests through April. Yeah. So if you missed it, not the end of the world, go check it out. If you feel like you can just wait for the next little go round, uh, you may have quite a wait on your hands. Yeah, you and I are also about to enter into a period where we're going to be doing a tremendous amount of video recording of explanations of various questions. We're working on a new course. Uh, we'll be posting videos that relate to, let's say, yeah. logical reasoning and logic games and just general test approaches. And that'll be a new course that comes out um, in 2021. So we're going to spend a lot of time on that. And I think you're going to see things like the crystal ball be a little bit less frequent, but we don't need to have it be constant when we're not getting new material. So speaking of new material, <laughs> nice. we recently got the May 2020 LSAT Flex form, I'll call it, one That's of fair. the forms that was used for that exam. So three sections. And when they did that, they uh, curiously did not give a scoring scale. And so we immediately began agitating for one. I sent them messages like, when's it coming? What's the deal? And I, was, I had started to pen a fairly, um, I'll say scathing, <laughs> open letter to <laughs> That's like, about what it was, yeah. you need to release a scoring scale for these tests because otherwise it just looks really bad. It looks incredibly sketchy, uh, very backroom kind of stuff. And... Um, Amazingly, they were like, no, we're going to do it. And then they changed their mind, it seemed like, said it was unavailable. And then they changed it back and said, we're going to do it after I sent them some more emails. So I feel like uh, we were able to squeeze not only the test out of them, but squeeze the scale out of them. And you've actually spent a lot of time uh, looking at this. And we've got a blog that's going to go up about the same time this podcast comes out. What do you think of the new scale? What's your take on it? Yeah, you're right about that. It's interesting. I was going to lie and say that the reason I was up so late last night was because of this new blog post and not because I was glued to CNN. Uh, it turns out it was actually a bit of both, column A and B. What did I think of this scale? Well, first of all, dude, props to you for um, continuing to lean pretty heavily on them to get this stuff done. Uh, Dave's right. For those of you who didn't follow the day-to-day, -day, when they released the test, all they said about the scale, which means basically it's utility, your ability to get a score was that it was coming soon. And then they changed that language to scale unavailable. And we threw a bit of a fit. <laughs> yeah. And they changed it back to coming soon. And then sure enough, uh, depending on your definition of soon, at least it did come yesterday. What did I think of it? It was, it was really interesting to watch. We broke it down at a, a bunch of different levels. And I don't want to get too deep into it because the blog post already does that. Um, but let me hit some of the, maybe the high watermarks of this scale, the things that people would care most about. The first is the thing people immediately gravitate to, which was the 170. This, on a flex curve, was a minus 9 test, this May form that they released. And it's available if you have Prep Plus on Law Hubs. You can go check it out. I thought that was more than fair, more than generous, especially now having done the test itself. Yeah. This was one that you and I had uh, conservatively, but originally predicted to be a minus 8. Mm -hmm. And as we always say when we make these predictions, we're going to err on the side of tight over loose, I still feel pretty good about what our prediction was. 
Um, I mean, it was wrong, so I could feel better. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was wrong with the proper intent. Uh, and I think it probably has a greater degree of long-term relevance and accuracy, the way that we called this, than this one-off test does, which I'll explain in a minute, or we can explain. Yeah, because I have some thoughts about how this scale looks compared to others, and we'll come back to that point. It's yeah. interesting because you know, you've said this many times before that when we estimate scales, if we're on the border, we go conservative, because mm -hmm. that way it's a worst case scenario for whoever's listening and thinking about what they might do. And if things turn out to be looser, that's just you know free money. It's a bonus that is floating around out there. Right. So... I when I saw this, was I surprised to see minus nine? Yeah, slightly. It explains several different things to me, which I'm sure we'll get into. But there is also some looseness to this scale, John. And I know it's in the pod or the in the blog that you're putting out. But tell me a little bit about some of the stuff that you saw about like this historical level of looseness. It seems like. Yeah. So the first thing we would want to do when we get a scale like this is try to make some equivalent form that would be historically relevant or. I don't know, comparable, I suppose, so that we could look at tests from 2018, 2019, 92, and see how this scale stacks up to those old four section tests. So that was one of the first things I did is I sat down and tried to like extrapolate this out into some equivalents. And really at every point through the mid range of this, minus nine on a flex for 170 is about a minus 12 uh, on a typical test. That's generous, let's call it, or forgiving, but far from unusual or unheard of. There have been a couple of tests in just the last few years that have been minus 12 or 13. And even but minus 14? Um, it's been a few years since we've seen a one of those, time. for sure. But yeah, yeah, I think since December 2016, there have been two that were 12 or better. Better if you're a student. So in looking at it, I started to track a little further backwards. I went to 160 and 150. And what I started to see through the middle, and I know you've seen it too, is that it really every one of these scoring outcome points, 160, 155, 150, even down to 145, this was a historically generous or loose scale. The number of questions required uh, on the equivalent form from this flex were lower than just about any test in history, and in many cases, the lowest in history for those mid-range results. In fact, I, I did the math two or three times to make sure I hadn't screwed it up. It's rare that you get handed a historical anomaly, <laughs> you know? It's much more common than I've made a mistake. <laughs> yeah, in this and, case, you know, that yeah. does reflect that apparently performance on that test wasn't fabulous on an overall level. I mean, when you have a looser scale like that, relatively speaking, it's because it's actually reflecting not great performance. And that doesn't, you know, that, that is something they may very well have expected going in. But I think one of the things that certainly makes us wonder is you know, how much of an effect did the at-home and new transition elements play a role in this? Yeah, there were two big factors beyond just innate test difficulty. You and I have done the test now. I didn't find anything unusually hard or unfair about it. In fact, if you had handed me this test before we had the curve and said, do you stick by your minus eight? I don't think I would have budged. I wouldn't have. So, Which isn't to say that it's it, – we're not saying it's an easy test. Minus no, 8 no. is is not an easy scale. Uh, when we start at minus 7 and think about that as our average, minus 8 is saying, hey, this was harder. And I do think as we will talk about that, uh, we're going to focus on the game section tonight in our discussion. And there are some difficult games in there. And I don't think the reading comp is easy. But you don't see anything that is like just mind-melting where all of a sudden you're like, I can't track what I'm reading, or I don't understand this game at all, and I don't know what to do with it. I didn't feel like there were any of those moments, especially in the game section. Any person doing this section that had studied the LSAT before would say, I can at least do some of this and get in, you know, fairly deep into it. I may not master every question, but I, at least this is a linear game. This is grouping. I know how to attack these. Same thing with reading comp. I didn't feel like anything was impossible to understand. Yeah, so setting aside anything of like overt objective difficulty, which again, I just didn't encounter much of, ditto for LR going through it. And again, I know you've spent more time with that than I have, but I didn't, the takeaway that I got from you wasn't like, oh man, look at these questions here. Look at this stretch of brutality. Uh, I just, I didn't see any of that. So I was surprised a little less by the minus nine versus minus eight thing. But when you start talking about like a 160, where this test required that you get 54 right, 
that translates to about a 71 or a 72 on a 101 question scale, which is what this would have been. There have only been three tests in the last 10 years where 72 right was the threshold of the minimum for a 160. Hmm. And there has not been a test where 71 right would have gotten you there. Ever? No. Wow. There have been some 72s. Uh, there have been <laughs> lots and lots of 73, 74s, 75s even. Correct but Correct answers is what you're referring correct to. Correct answers, raw score that you have to get out of 100, 101 questions to get to a 160. But never where you could pull a 160 with a 71 raw score, which is, again, what this test would have translated to. So, yeah, I was just looking at it. I was like, where did the difficulty come from? Because if you set aside the content itself, it has to have been basically bred out of either the novelty of the experience or the loss of LR that there was a subset of people through the mid-ranges where a single LR versus two punished them more um, than others. Yeah, because you reach a point here where you start to wonder how much was the scale adjusted due to the changing of the experience. And we often say scales are created before the test itself. And I think that is, uh, by and large, the way that it is. However, this was a different experience. Right. This wasn't a regular four-scored section test where you're going into a big room, something that they have administered over and over again. So the fact that they might do some adjustment to the particular format of this new exam, that's not either, it's neither surprising nor you know, suspicious. I figured that they would do a little bit of that. So don't be concerned if you're like, wait, I thought the scale was formed beforehand. That's the first thing. The second thing is this, is we've never dealt with a situation in the modern times where there was only one logical reasoning section. So we don't know what happens, psychometrically speaking, when they remove one of those sections. When they do that, it may have a much bigger effect than we've understood, and that loosened the scale up. And I don't know that anyone would, you know, we're talking about heavy statistical analysis that no one outside of LSAC has access to. But this does give us some ideas. So, yeah, we obviously can't see the data and the algorithms that they have at their disposal. Um, but I can hear off in the distance. I, I don't think it's actually off in the distance. But an outcry from people. I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to pretend it's the podcast audience and not my neighborhood burning down. Uh, in that, a lot of people would then be saying, "Well, then how is this fair?" We've been asked that question so many times. And to me, when I looked at this scale, it begged to a degree the question once more is if it's influencing the results or the percentiles of people this much, is this truly an equivalent test? And happily, the answer is in the question, which is to say that's what the scale does. Yeah, it's supposed to produce the same type of results no matter what the test is. This is an unusual experience to go from a different format to uh, you know, from one format to another one, but this is the point of these scales. So some adjustments here may very well be uh, being executed in order to create something that is similar. I personally have felt that the LSAT Flex has a degree of variability to it that is both higher and lower. I've seen so many really high scores come out of this that people were surprised by, elated by, obviously, when they're yeah. like, well, I've been PTing at 175 and I got a 178. Or 161 was my highest and I got a 164 or 167. And we've seen people who have been like, I was you know, hitting 159 and I got a 154. So I have felt for a while the variability is greater than on prior tests. And that makes sense. There are fewer questions, and so each question has a greater effect. But I think one of the things that may have happened here is, is that these first couple of scales are on the loose side, and then they got to August, which they knew was going to be a gigantic test. And I feel like maybe in August what they did is they tightened the scale a little bit more and drove scores down a little bit there. I think so too. Yeah. Now, the problem is, is the data that they've been releasing this year has been really up and down. You know, there's the supposedly daily uh, updates of the, of the volume and test scores and so forth, but that didn't start on these flex tests until very recently. So it's really hard for us to see exactly what happened. I can kind of track those changes and I see that there's a high scoring bubble at 165 all the way to the top which was something I talked about after the crystal ball was over. Like, what do I think is going to happen with this cycle? Will it be more competitive? 
So if you were there for that, I said, yes, I do think it will be more competitive, this cycle, and that's part of the reason why. But as you look at that, I think this is a learning process for them as well. They can run all the stats in the world, but until they actually see people sit down at home and take this test, they don't know what's going to happen. And so maybe there were some adjustments made and they could be continuing adjustments. Here's the good news though. A scale this loose is great for everybody. This is what you want to see. I think they've done it on more than one occasion and that tells people who are taking November or January or whenever, you might get a loose scale too. And you want to go in as an optimist and then mm -hmm. see how the, ch you know, the chips fall and then worry about it afterwards. But take that to heart. That is a really positive piece of news. Scales that are more generous than we expected and among a historic level of looseness yeah. have been used here. That's great. We want to see that every single time, to be honest. Yeah, minus nine was more generous than I expected, but hardly surprising. Some of the other minus amounts through the 50s and 60s weren't just more generous than I expected. I'd have lost the mortgage betting against them. Um, they were just so so far off of the current trends in terms of what we've been seeing recently. And like I said, I, that's a good thing for people. Anybody who hears that and they're like, oh, what the hell? No, that's good. Anytime that happens, any even semblance of charity is to your benefit, test taker. Test taker acts. Test taker. And it was interesting too. One of the things that I immediately wanted to look at was what happens. You've got 61 possible scores across a scale from an initial standpoint. So you go 120 to 180, you got 61. You had 76 questions. I was really interested in what the floor would be before you started moving out of 120. Right. And then right. how many scores would you lose in both the 120s, 130s, and then mostly the 170s, but you know, conceivably the 160s at times. And it was fascinating to me because that was the first thing I went and counted. There were two scores that were unavailable uh, in the 160s and 170s, and they were both at the upper end of the 170 side. It was 176 and 178 were impossible to achieve on this test. Nobody got a 176 or a 178 on this form of the May test. There may have been other forms of the May test where people did, but not on this particular form. However, you look in the 120s and the 130s, there are seven scores right. that are impossible to get. And so you can kind of see what's happening is, is they've got a lot of people at these kind of like break points for law schools. They weren't going to drop out 168. I would have had too much of an effect on admissions, but they made sure to drop those scores early on. And that's what allowed them to have 76 questions translate into 61 possible scores, yeah. especially because you had to get 15 right even to just break 120. Yeah. You were not a 120 as your result until you got 16 questions right, which is yeah. about 21 right on a normal test, an all-time high, <laughs> interestingly <laughs> enough. So as loose as things were in the middle and even towards the upper end, as favorable, at the bottom of this scale towards 120 and 130, we set some new records, some different records for stinginess, basically. And this is an interesting thing because, you know, we knew it was going to look something like this. I, you know, we didn't know it was going to be two scores in the 170s and seven in the 120s and the 130s. But one of the tip-offs to me was when they released the scale this week. Um, they released it on Tuesday. And I looked at that scale when it came out and I was like, something's up. And, uh, and here's why. When LSAT scales have been released, and if you've ever had a paper prep test, you can look in the back of that, uh, that booklet or book and you will see the LSAT scoring conversion scale. And the way those work is they have a column on the left-hand side that is built around your scaled score. 120 is at the bottom, then it moves up 121 all the way to 180 at the top. And then there are two columns to the right of that, one of which is they're both about raw score, and it's like lowest raw score, highest raw score. And so you kind of move up that way. And that's the way every single scale I've ever seen has been released. Yeah, but the guiding sort of track line in this has been that every number from 120 to 180, all 61 rows basically, are yes. there. They're, all 61 rows are there. And occasionally there are scores that are impossible. You can't get a 179 on this test. You can't get a 123 on that test. So it's nothing you know, sinister that there are <laughs> scores that you can't achieve. But I've been wondering why there was a delay in the May scale. And it is 
crossed my mind more than once that they regret releasing this test. Uh, I would. I don't, you know, we pushed them to release it, but I didn't think they would listen. So for me, I wonder if there was some degree of regret, like, okay, we put out the test and then they realize we don't really want to show the scale because it tells people a lot about what we're doing. So what did they do when they released this scale? They didn't do it using the scaled 120 to 180 scores. They used the raw score as the marker. So it started off with... From zero to 76. Yeah, zero to 76. And what that does is every raw score does get a scaled score. So you can't tell that there are gaps. And one of the things that I liked about the way we put this scale on our blog was we immediately reverted back to the original form, which shows all the gaps. And personally... Uh, I feel like they were trying to hide something there. They didn't want people to question why are so many scores missing. They're not going to answer any questions that we pose or that you pose about it. But I feel like that was a sleight of hand maneuver. And it immediately made me suspicious. I was like, why is this the first scale ever to be released like this? I've never seen one before. Yeah. Otherwise, it would have shown very clearly nine missing questions or nine missing score outcomes. Yeah, uh, nine scale scores. When, yeah, when you and I got it yesterday, we both kind of scuttled off into some, I don't know, dark hole somewhere and <laughs> started playing with it and turned around and we're talking about it today. And I was like, oh, by the way, here's what I did with it. And you go, I'll be damned. I did the same thing. We had both <laughs> independently turned it back into let's have this actually based from 120 to 180 yep. as the guideline and then we'll put the numbers to it. We knew exactly what was going on. <laughs> but when you glance at it, especially if you're not like professionally into this, you wouldn't really think about it. You'd be like, oh, look, each score has – each each Ross point has a score. And I'm like, yes, it does, but that doesn't show in the reverse. So you make of it what you may. I did not appreciate it. I don't like feeling like something's being done and delayed – and kind of like hem and hawing, and then it comes out different, that's when I start to think, hmm, why do they do that? Yeah, I've got a secondary personal gripe to this, which is that in that crystal ball that we did Monday night, I had a fairly lengthy, comprehensive discussion about how the scaling on the flex works. And I did that more or less sight unseen, because it wasn't until the next day that they actually released a scale that would have been awfully helpful. <laughs> to have at least had to point to or refer to. So we were, I was a day premature. They did that on purpose to us. I, th I think <laughs> they had to have known. <laughs> and I'm joking. Uh, love those guys. <laughs> but slighted. I felt like, oh, the day after we have a gigantic seminar where we talk about what's going on, then you release this thing that we've been asking for for two weeks. Mm, felt personal to me. If even I, though I'm sure it wasn't. It's hard not to. Are you familiar with the old um, logical like axiom about Hanlon's razor? You know what this is? Yeah, we've sure talked about the different before. razors that are out right. there. Yeah. Hanlon's razor goes like this. It's never a tribute to malice, that which could be explained by incompetence. <laughs> and I feel like at times that's kind of what we're doing here. Was this a sinister subplot? Was this something they actually calculated? Or were they just kind of stumbling around and this yeah. is how it played out? I don't even think it was incompetence here. I think it was just no, the, course, a strong word. the course of things. That's the when it came up on their screen. That's when they got to it. I know they've been busy with a bunch of different things over there. So, again, I don't think it was malicious. Was it irritating to me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I know it irritated you because you did that section in the crystal ball and you were like, mm-hmm, thanks. This would have been cool to have and we had been hoping that we would have it yeah. for the crystal yeah. ball. We just couldn't push it any later. So The one redeeming thing I can say about that discussion in the crystal ball is I wouldn't change any of it. I might have had a different slide to show, but the talking points, the conversion, the process that we have used to create our own flex tests and scoring, 100% rock solid. If anything, this just locked it down as even more uh, accurate. Yeah, I think this scale has some degrees of looseness to it, but it's not tremendously far off. You know, a lot of the predictions that we've made, I still feel very comfortable uh, going forward. We might loosen some of our predictions a little bit because if this is going to continue, it's good to know that. But we'll judge that after we hear about the test itself. It's still all yeah. about difficulty to me. You made so. mention of August, and I, I think we could group October in here as well, as having the very clear appearance of tightening back up. Yeah. So despite the fact that we were maybe a bit overly cautious or tight on this scale, um, I think we had the right mindset about it, the right perspective. The most recent tests seem to have done exactly what we thought this test was going to do to begin with. Yeah, and you're dealing with a new test. May was the first time we'd ever sure. seen anything like this. Caution should be your byword there. 
So I don't feel bad about it or concerned in any way. With that said, Mm -hmm. let's ditch the conversation about the May 2020 scoring scale and move to a conversation about the May 2020 Logic Games section. So here's the way it works. If you have not taken this section, you're going to want to hold off and listen to this later because it will be prejudicial in the sense that it'll give you some tip-offs to the way to approach these games, uh, some of the more interesting rules that we might actually see out there, and occasionally some of the more interesting deductions and approaches that we took. But what we want to be able to do is to kind of go through this section so that if somebody has done it, and hopefully you know, many of you have, that you could then listen to this and think, did I do this the right way? Did my perceptions of difficulty and the choices that I made match up to what sounds like a really optimal approach to this? So it's kind of like um, slow motion instant replay, in a <laughs> sense, where we're going to talk it through and uh, kind of go through with what we did here. So with that in mind, this was a 23-question section, and the very first game that came up was, I felt like, a really solid start to a section like this. This is a game that we have dubbed the local and non-local calls. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk about it here, and then I will make mention of the fact that in our free LSAT discussion forum, we have sections for every one of the you know, LR, LG, RC on each LSAT, I've started to explain this section so far. And I've gotten through the first game, I'm into the second game explaining the setup and so forth. So uh, over the coming weeks, I'll add everything else in there. So you can not only listen to what we say here, but if you want to go actually see the rule representations, the discussion of the inferences, a complete explanation of each question, that is on our form and it is free to the world. Because we're nice that way. (laughs) <laughs> well, you in particular, because you're actually out there proactively explaining things. I tend to wait until I'm asked, but good for I you. I like to do it, man. I like to see the game, and then I'm like, ooh, I, this is a really cool point, and then I want to share it with everybody and be like, check out this inference. This is the kind of thing that you can learn from so that next time it doesn't get you. Well, as we will see, back to this first game, I think this was a very good one to learn from, a favorable start to the section uh, for just about anyone who is decently prepared. Uh, And a a few different opportunities here, one of which I found to be, you could just bank some time. If you can start the section on a high note, get through the first game under your time, sort of optimal pacing, then it's going to essentially give you this safety net, this cushion. Yeah, I think the way this section was built, in my opinion, is if you're going to master it and get everything right and feel like you crushed it or, you know, get really close to having everything right, the first two games are designed where you gain time. And then the last two games, you're probably going to lose a little bit of time. So we talk a lot about eight minutes and 45 seconds, you know, for each game. I want to remind everybody that is a average in terms of the markers. It is okay to go faster and it is okay to expend more time. It's just that when you do those things, do them with cause. Go faster because you can and you can be comfortable. Spend more time because it's deserved and you have it. So... That means some games might take you seven minutes. Some games might take you 10 minutes. Those things are completely normal. It is okay to have that little bit of like variance from the so-called average. It's a guideline and a general idea, not a hard, fast rule. I like that. Yeah, we've talked about how to pace yourself, how to speed up in logic games. And there's a lot of that discussion there too. So so let's, let's talk about this game. Yeah, first game is kind of interesting. It's an investigator and there's these five calls that were made. And so you've got the five calls that are floating around, and they are one of two types that we're actually going to work with, local and non-local. And if I'm reading that as I open it up, I'm immediately thinking it's an advanced linear type of game. you got five calls in a row that looks like linear, and then there's five people that we have, and then there's an identifying trait of each one, local or non-local. It seems like I can make a row for the people and make a row for the local, non-local, and Advanced linear, fill in 10, looks good to me. And I really like the upper row being just local or non-local because that's a binary choice. You're one or the other. That's how I had it too. Did you do LN or did you do L slash L? (laughs) This is funny. I put this in the explanation on our forum. I did L and slash L. Ah, I did L and N. That's okay. I said if you did it like L and then NL or L and N, that's all right too. It's whatever works for you. I don't, you know, that's... There's, All right. I'll go read no your explanation. If I, 
if I start to feel bad about myself. I appreciate nah, you giving us in, folks, the, uh, the affirmation. Thanks. Now, there's no altar upon which I'm going <laughs> to sacrifice uh, to the god of L slash L here. I just don't care. It's like whatever works for you. Uh, so if you want to go in and change my explanation to L and N, you do it. I won't do it. <laughs> I know better. He's saying that because this is being recorded. He'll text me after. Don't you dare. Don't you touch it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the setup on that game's not bad. You know, 10 spaces to fill in. That that upper row has just two choices for it. So I felt like, okay, this is a manageable game. And then as we got into it, I'm not going to read each of the rules in their entirety. Uh, LSAC doesn't love us to do that. But the very first rule, I thought, was the critical rule in the game. It created both a sequence and a block where there was a QV block and then S was ahead of that block or earlier in the stream. And if you think about this for a second, you've got five variables. You now have three of them in a relationship. My first thought, and I'm sure this was the same for you, is how many places can I put this thing? Mm -hmm. Not very many. And so then the second rule was about the calls for both S and V. They were different call types. One was local, one was non-local. I'm like, okay, that's going to be one of these rules that comes in after I've placed some variables. And then they told us that two of the calls, Q and T, were both local. I'm like, well, that's fantastic. That creates two powerful blocks that are vertical that are going to fit inside this diagram. And then it continued on with the generosity, in my opinion, and yeah, they were like, things broke open for me. Yeah, the third call was non-local. And what did you do at this point? So you've, you've looked at all the rules. Diagramming all that is really, I think, clear and straightforward. This is one of the things I like about this game. It is clean. There's no messy open-endedness, which we will see later in this section. It was nice and clean. What was your, your maneuver here? This was one of those instances, because it's not always the case. In fact, I think very shortly we'll see a, an instance where we depart from one another. But this was one where immediately it became clear to me that templates were the way to go. As soon as it listed the type of call that was in the middle, I saw instantly how that was going to affect the first rule's block. Yes, and it's interesting because for me, the first rule was the one where I was like, I started thinking about templates immediately. Because if you've got an S kind of like um, sequence, then to QV, I was like, QV, that block can only go in 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5. Mm-hmm. So that was like thinking three templates. And one of the things they you know, told us in the rules, the very last rule, was that Q was a local call. So what you're pointing out, John, is that when the third call was non-local, that yeah. QV block couldn't be three, four. One of those block options for the QV, yeah, you basically go from three positions for the block to only two. And at that point, if a block can only go two places and it controls something else, and we know something about its component pieces, Q in this case bring on the templates. Yep. And so that triggers two templates, one with QV in positions two and three, and the other with QV in positions four and five. And when you look at those two templates, the first one with QV in two and three, you fill in a lot. S has got to be first, Q and V are second and third. That gives you the complete lineup of the first two calls being local and the third being non-local. And then you're left with R and T, who rotate between four and five, and you also know that T, because of that last rule, is local. You, the first template is almost completely filled in, and the big yeah. question is, which one's fourth or fifth, and what's R? So, yeah, that's basically it. When I did that, I immediately thought, this won't get tested too often. <laughs> this is too full. Uh, and then That's funny, to- I had the same thought with it. I was like, I bet this gets me one point. Yeah, I was like, we have it, but <laughs> they're not gonna they're not gonna mine this too often because it's really powerfully filled in. And so then the other template is QV in four and five, and that is a lot more open. You know that the fourth call is local and the third's non-local, but you have TS and R in the first three, and there's some rules that affect. Uh, you know, T can't be third, for example, so T's got to be first and second. But they test this template a lot more in this game. Overall, yeah. though. You know, we're not going to go through the questions because when you've got two templates like that, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, and the I, questions you know, are done. Yeah, we're really focusing on the setup, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on the questions either way. But all these games were fairly standard in the sense that there were some list questions, there were some local, global. In a template like this, especially with that second one being open, they tossed in a few scenarios asking you what was going on. 
you know, if Ross call was local and that, that told you certain things, you could just jump into one template or the other. A really, I thought, positive start to this section. Yeah, and very reminiscent, too, of what we've seen on a lot of recent tests, where the first game is either basic linear or maybe a simple advanced linear like this is. Opportunities early in a section to do templates. I was reminded through this game of, uh, was it June 2019, where you had that five position base, something happened right in the middle, and there was a block that just hopped one, two, four, five, back and forth. Yep. Templates. I think that's the right test, but it was very reminiscent of this. This had a second row to it. But something happened in the middle, and you had a block that was hopping around it. When you've got five variables or seven variables in a linear scenario, <laughs> there's been a number of games where the third <laughs> position or the fifth position, whichever is the middle in that, that little run out, is kind of like a dividing wall. And I love those games because I love symmetry, and those games feel very symmetrical. So... You know, but that SQV rule that's there first, that is so powerful. You've got to be thinking immediately, this is limiting. Look for limitations and also be thinking this way. Be looking to make templates. As we talked about in the crystal ball, usually 50% of the games on a given LSAT can be mastered using templates. So it is something that you have to have in your arsenal. I don't know if there's a whole lot more to say about that. No, but that's a really nice segue into game two, because if you have templates in your arsenal... <laughs> you should dun, use dun, them dun. here, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, moving into game two, you will find that templates tend not to be just singularly rewarding. They often uh, double and occasionally triple up. I I'm a little less template... Uh, I'm a little less of a template file, maybe, than you. Yeah. Um, I I'm cautious, and you tend to just be full speed ahead. Nothing wrong with either one. Uh, that's not, there's no insult in that. That's not pejorative. When I say full speed ahead, you're just, if you see a template, you attack it. If I yeah. see a template, I'm like, well, do I need to? But in that first game, we're completely in unison on it. Yeah, well, I think the reason I'm full speed ahead with templates is because I know it's an exploration that will yield information. So to me, that feels like a really good use of my time. Whereas I think you're a little bit more circumspect about it. And I thought like for sure you were going to call me lazy. <laughs> <laughs> what, that's what, Whereas you that's don't want to pick I up meant. a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> nah, that's not what I meant. I just mean that I think you're a little bit warier of it because you feel like I might not need to do it. Whereas for me, I'm like, what harm will occur here? I'll get some information and if I feel like I can't get any more, I'll just stop doing it. So yeah, I'm a little more aggressive with the templating than you are. That's fair. Which is, again, to say that the way you should approach it as a student out there is what works for you. For some, it would be more my approach. For some, it would be more John's approach. And that's okay. There's no right or wrong. What's right or wrong is what works for you. Yeah. We only know this about ourselves and really now about each other because we've done this enough times to see what, what it is that not only we prefer, but how the other one does it. I can sit down and mostly diagram, the, diagram a game the way that I think you would. I'd have put slashes through that L on the first game, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you'd done that, it would have been perfect, John. That uh, was all I was missing. Oh, well. Yeah, so <laughs> we go from game one, which was an advanced linear game. It was really nicely balanced. Use the templates on it. Now we come to game number two, which is going to turn out to be a grouping game. Do you want to kind of talk through this one a little bit? Sure. Yeah, this one start, starts to sound like another linear game as it begins. You've got these six people uh, playing table tennis during lunch. Sounds like kind of a fun place to work. And three games of table tennis, each game, obviously two of the six people. So you've got this balance, but when it talks about games one, two, and three, I think the initial instinct for a lot of people, I might admit this of myself, is to begin to think, I wonder if they're going to order out the games. Maybe group the people, games one, two, and three as pairs, but I wonder if there's an order to this. Yeah. It gives you the balance to it. Everybody plays just one game. They take place one after another. And so I'm kind of like, you know, rubbing my hands and thinking, here comes linear. And it just never goes there. The one, two, and three become groups of two people yeah, as opposed just, to order of games. They're just identifiers and the, there is no ordering aspect to this. So, yeah, as you said, just a grouping game here. And then the other giveaway to that as you start to read through the four rules is that each of them essentially talks about collections of people together, apart, but never gives anything about sequence or chronology, I suppose, to this. Yeah. Yeah. I liked this game, though, too. Um, this game it required a little bit more work on my part, 
But once I had done the work, I felt great about it and I was able to move through the questions pretty comfortably. And I felt like even if you didn't show templates, you'd still be okay here. It's again, a matter of comfort. And maybe it is laziness. I'm, I'm lazy in a different way though. I just like to write it down and not think about it anymore. Then it's on the page. Whereas you're like, your laziness is, I don't even want to write it down. (laughs) <laughs> so <laughs> we tend just to approach it. We're both lazy. That's the uh, the takeaway here, just in different sure. ways. It manifests itself unusually. <laughs> in this game, though, uh, I think regardless of which approach you took, I- I'm I'm right with you. I started doing this game, and one of the things that I liked about it, a little bit like the first game, at least one of its rows, is that it balances. There's six people. It tells you exactly how they're divided. You use the word clean for the first game. There's not a lot of messiness or uncertainty. I felt this game was very clean as well. 100% there with you. Which is good. Yeah. We're, we're not going to get to, I think, milk that luxury through the whole section. But for the first half of it, not bad. Well, this is what you want to see. If you had time to do just one game, uh, you know, let's say you've done two and you're down to one, I'm going to go for the game that looks cleaner every single time at a glance. And all the rules here are very straightforward. They're not open-ended. And the reason I make mention of that is because we will see open-ended rules in just a few minutes. Both games one and two have really uh, clear lines in terms of the way they are balanced. Everything's being used once. The rules are very clear with these blocks and sequences and so forth. It is really nice. When we get to this game, uh, when I looked at it, again, you've got four rules It's not out of control either. It's not like a six or seven rule game. I can understand this scenario. It's two, two, and two. It's like, all right, I got to use everybody once. They're going to have to battle it out. What's going to happen here? Sure. So let's take a look at the rules. Yeah, the first two rules have a nice, almost like redundancy to them, symmetry to them, where the first rule talks about two people who can't play in the first game. The second rule, two different people who can't play in the third game, the last game. Which is kind of interesting. In and of itself, it just means to me, I was like, not laws. I didn't know what was going to happen, you know, in my approach to this. But I was like, well, all right, F and G can't be first. Uh, J and L can't be third. That's limiting. It tells me that game two's got a lot of options. And now I'm focused on games one and three. But I wasn't like losing my mind here. I was like, okay, took me a second to diagram those onto the third rule. What was that? Perfect. Uh, it was a partial grouping or a partially specific grouping where F had to be with either G or H. So very limiting for F, but don't make the mistake of thinking this is a two-way street necessarily. G could still go with other people. H could go with other people. This is really about who F controls. Yeah. F's with one of the two, mm-hmm. but the the others can be with anybody. So when you saw this rule, how did you react to it? I'm curious to know how you diagrammed it in part. So let me let me start with how I did Because I paused for a second. I was like, what's the laziest way to diagram this? And (laughs) what I did was in parentheses, I had an F and then just next to it a G slash H. That's what I showed. That that was like the collection. When I did this in in, in my setup, I had as a vertical block with F on the bottom. And as I have said in the setup explanation, it, it doesn't really matter what's top or bottom in this game. The, the rows don't mean anything. It's just two people playing the same game. In other games, it would be, but not in this one. And so I had F on the bottom, and then on top of it, I had G slash H. And I drew out a block. Now, when I wrote the explanation on our forum, I said it's either FG or FH. And part of the reason I did that is because the diagramming tools that we have on the forum don't allow me to draw blocks around stuff and make it really, really clear. So I didn't want to mess with it. I was like, let me make this rule crystal clear. But Slight differences in the way we presented it uh, there, but it's the same idea. F's with one of those two. Yeah. The orientation I had in this game, too, was a straight line across of one through six, partly because I jumped the gun a little bit and thought it was going to be linear. (laughs) But then under the first two spots, I put a one, under the next two, a two, under the next one was a three, and then just drew hashes between the the linear. Horizontal pairs is what you had all the way. Horizontal pairs. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, I had three Um, pairs of vertical. I'm having episode 69 flashbacks. (laughs) <laughs> I didn't think you'd be able to pull that off, that reference, but you've just done it successfully. I well was going to do it when you said before there didn't matter who was on top or bottom, but I waited. <laughs> you waited and you tossed me another one. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just serving up softballs here for you to hit out of the park, apparently. Yeah, that's right. And I didn't even know it. Ah, uh, well. Excellent. Teamwork. 
I can so tell that's, you. Yeah, that's how I had it. But again, I did in parentheses. I'm sure you could do this if you wanted to conditionally even. I mean, technically, this is a conditional rule. Yeah, I didn't. I just went right for the block because I knew F was the trigger and I wasn't worried about it. It's always going to be F with G or H. You've got to have that no matter what. So I wasn't going to show this conditionally. And I think, as you know, I love to use like horizontality and verticality and diagrams and then put block rules in there that occupy space. I think it's visually powerful. It's really easy and intuitive to understand. So in the setup I've made in our form, I have done it as a kind of like two rows on top of each other. So there is a vertical component that is there. You did something that's additionally visually powerful in this game that we'll get to. Let's knock the fourth rule out and then you can, uh, we can talk maybe about where our roads diverge in this wood. The last rule just is a not block itself, which says that G and J can't be together. How do you, you feel think? about that? Were you like, yeah, stumped, <laughs> baffled? <laughs> a vertical knot block, G and J don't like each other. And by the way, I picked up on your Robert Frost reference, ah, which nice. means you went from a 69 reference to Robert Frost. That, that's some latitude there, man. Oh, thank that's, you very much. That's breadth. Man of many talents. <laughs> no depth, but a lot of breadth there. <laughs> yeah. I'm uh, read mostly in picture books. So G and J can't be together. The way that I had this was just G, J next to each other with a slash through them. But then I put sort of as a little sub-reference for myself, number two, meaning that I thought that was probably going to be most impactful in game two. Because G again couldn't go in game one, J couldn't go in game three. So I was like, where are they in most danger of overlapping game two? So I put a little note to myself about like, this is where they're going to maybe intersect. Watch for it. Okay. And, and that's then a strange, are... I think that's a strange thing for some people to, to think about. It's not how they tend to approach games. But if you can begin to anticipate where the consequences of rules could potentially come about, looking at your setup and be like, I can't show anything here yet, but I can see why that position could ultimately matter, find a way to note it. Yeah, because those two variables, one of them is knocked out of game one, the other is knocked out of game three. So two is that crossover ground where they might try to occupy one and three with some of the other variables and then force them into a scenario that's impossible, both of them playing game two. Exactly. And that, that does come up. It is very interesting because I think at this point, you'd kind of looked at it, you thought about the relationships, you were comfortable, you went off to the questions. Yeah, I was also rushing to get through this before we recorded the podcast today, if I'm fully honest. It's full disclosure. <laughs> so I was like, I could probably do some templates here, but I see the clock is ticking. I so have, I just I have... dove into the questions and went through them. I did this game very quickly. I think I probably did this game in about three minutes. That's ridiculous. Thank you. Congratulations. How many questions yeah. did you skip? <laughs> I didn't say how I many I got right. But. <laughs> I know you got them all right. Um, <laughs> but you made a different tactical choice here, uh, a more considered and I think probably better tactical choice. I think it was a really solid choice. And the benefit of it, as we'll see in a minute, was that when I went into the questions, I was able to do them quickly. So I spent more time on the setup than you. And I won't say that I was leisurely about it. I was more methodical in terms of what I was attempting to do. When I saw those first two rules, I was like, okay, no big deal here. It's just eliminating some variables from the first and the last game sets. And then when I got to that third rule and I realized that F was stuck with G or H, and I knew from the first rule that F couldn't be in the first game, immediately my mind said, all right, that position of F and G or H has only four options. It's either F and G in game two or F and H in game two. Or it's F and G in game three, and F or F and H in game three. And so I just made four quick mini templates, which wasn't that tough because there are only six spaces. So yeah. it's a real quick sketch out. I just like immediately skeletonized those four scenarios, put F and G in game two. And as soon as you do that, you start realizing, well, now that F and G have occupied game two, J and L, who from one of the rules... Uh, the second rule can't be in game three. They're forced into game one, and that forces M and H into game three. And so when F and G are second, the whole template fills up. The same thing happens when F and H are second. Yeah, filling G and right L too. get or J and L get forced into the first game, and that leaves M and G in the third game. So I was like, this is great. You put F into the second one, and depending on whether it's with G or H, there's only one solution with each. Yeah. Super powerful. I can. Yeah, I'm. I'm 
didn't write these down or do them, but I can see them in my head. I imagine F and H in three was really powerful as well. Yeah, it's it ends up being powerful. F and G in three, not so powerful. Yeah, F and G I think is the one that's open. F and it's H in three, totally it's open. open. Then all of a sudden you're like, uh, you're you're flipping around with H, G, L, and M, and there's actually a lot of options there in terms of what can happen. So didn't worry about that and just left it kind of open on the third template. And then when you put F and H in the third game, then all of a sudden G and L end up having some issues. G, it's got to be in game one or two, but we already know from the first rule that it can't be first, so it has to go second. It can't be with J from the last rule, so it, J has to go first, and that leaves you just floating around with L and M. And it's it's limited, but it still has some options. Yeah, F and H and three is probably the most non-obviously um, filled in template. Yeah. It but if you can do that well, man, talk about rewards. Yeah. So you've got two templates that have a single solution. You got another template with two solutions and then a third template with F and G in the third game that's that's more open, but still isn't got a huge number of solutions. I was like, I'm I'm feeling great. I rolled right into the questions. Very happy at this particular point because I was like, this is nice. This section feels easy to me. There's a really straightforward, in my opinion, way to attack this that gives you a tremendous amount of information, makes it very unlikely that you're going to miss questions. And even if you had to invest a little bit more time to do that, that's okay because you could say to yourself, all right, I'm getting all the questions right again. And if I don't, it's going to be at most one that you would miss. And so in this test, that gives you through the first 11 questions. You're almost at the halfway point. First 11 questions, you're feeling pretty good. Two template games. Love it. Yeah. You're on top of the world at this point. You've just done the first two games with sets of templates that you knocked out in a hurry. <sighs> Happy days. Again, I'm trying thrilled. to figure out where this minus nine came from. Uh, because it wasn't games one and two. There was one other slight wrinkle in game two, just to draw people's attention to it. The rule substitution question. Question yes. 11. I didn't think that was the easiest question. And they did this because the rest of the setup was so uh, compact and put together. So the rule sub question, which is the very last question in that particular game, is going to force you to work. And I thought it was one of the harder versions of rule substitution that I'd seen as well. However, I will say this. Having the templates made this question a lot easier because I could see what was causing some of the issues and not causing some of the issues. It allowed me to eliminate all the wrong answers relatively quickly. Yeah, so, that's how I went through it too, with just sort of a, a basic bare bones sketch. But man, would templates have made my life easier. So you win this round. Template winner. <laughs> <laughs> I almost said that in my Sean Connery voice and then thought better of it. Let's hear it. Nope. <laughs> nope. I'm going to need more. I'm going to need more vodka. <laughs> well, start drinking, man. Yeah. I don't know how that dude lived to 90, man. The, this first one's going down. They must have used props on set or something because I'm sipping slowly over here. He was probably drinking water. Those are strong drinks, though. I don't know, man. Some filming movies in the 60s makes me not so sure. Well, I don't know. I will say this, though. After f having the first two games go down pretty smoothly and feeling like there was a lot of control... The first thing that crossed my mind was, I wonder what happens next. Yeah. Because I don't think it's going to be this fluid and easy as far as working through this. Because I didn't feel like I was really working incredibly hard. I felt like at all times, there's a clear point of attack here. I'm not scrambling to make mini diagrams for each individual question in a lot of instances. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm referring back to the templates. And when I did have to do work, it was based off a template that was mostly filled in anyway. So it felt really smooth, which gives me fear. Yeah, conspicuously, suspiciously smooth. Those uh, when I start feeling really good halfway through a game section, I almost like want to reach for a metaphorical seatbelt or something. Well, this you know, what's I mean, next? We just saw this on the October test. Those people who had the Shredder game section, the first three games, yeah, they there was work to be done, but we know that it wasn't like mind-blowing or crushing or terrible. By the time they got to the fourth game, what they should have had in the back of their mind was please, please don't be as bad as it could be. And, and what they should have had on screen bad. was like 13 minutes. So, Yes, we saw a lot of people come in with extra time, and that makes a huge difference. But if I come into the fourth game with like 15 minutes, you know what I'm thinking? Bet this is going to be hard. I bet I need it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, so let's go to that third what game. What did we get? See whether or not it was borne out that it was a, a tougher one. 
Well, you can tell right away in reading this that it's uh, uh, ramping up a little bit. They've definitely dialed the volume up, maybe not to an 11, but certainly above where it was. Um, there's this academic society with six meetings uh, during a school year, and it splits them evenly. So again, six, that's what we had in the last game, three into three, but even numbered splits. I like that, fall and spring semesters. And then things get a little stranger. The meetings are held in five cities. Part of what's strange is the cities they chose. Huh. Uh, <laughs> it's ridiculous choices. It's a bizarre mix. So you've got Honolulu, which is great, Montreal, Vancouver. I went out of order for a reason, uh, because the other two were Omaha and Tampa. <laughs> Tampa, and, I can understand. That's a big kind of like I conference guess. location. I mean, I had such like an inflection of disgust when I said Tampa. I didn't mean it to. I'm just surprised by those choices. You know, the the west coast of Florida, the Gulf Coast there, I like it in general. So I don't have any Tampa hate. The only thing about Tampa was when I've been there, I'm always amazed at how flat Tampa itself is. <laughs> that was my first impression. I was like, boy, this is a flat area. And Florida in general is relatively flat. So, you know, maybe I shouldn't have had that kind of response. Yeah, Florida's pretty flat. I remember I was, uh, this is a weird story, but you know our buddy Sean's wife, Leslie, we were in Mexico one time in Puerto Vallarta, and we were just driving away from the beach, and she goes, I wonder what the altitude is here. And I looked at her, and I said, I think we're at sea level. That's how I feel about Florida. <laughs> I think I looked up the highest point in Florida at one point in my life, and it's like 138 feet or something ridiculous. Sounds about right. So... <laughs> I wonder what elevation we're at. Okay. And then, yeah, speaking <laughs> of tabletops, you've got Nebraska, Omaha. And I can't figure what Omaha is, is doing here. Maybe it's a Warren Buffett That's shout out. Be, I can't yeah. tell. Got to be a Buffett I, toss. I will say that when I talked to students after this test and I saw comments about this and people were like, oh, the game about, they would say things like Honolulu or Montreal or whatever the, you know, the locations were. I never heard anybody say Omaha. Like Omaha just didn't register on on the map for people. So yeah, I so checked many... our notes specifically to be like, did we have the O? Uh, we did not. I think we, we had O, but not Omaha. We didn't know it was Omaha, and that was because it was so nondescript to people that it just dropped out of their 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 thinking. And I think I've driven through <laughs> Omaha. I don't know that I've ever have actually you? stopped there, so I have nothing neither good nor bad to say other than Nebraska's super flat as well. There you go. So there's your five cities into these six positions, two semesters, three and three. And this is the first time really in this game, aside from the local, non-local, that we get a clear numerical mismatch. Note that I didn't say distribution, but mismatch. The five and the six clearly don't perfectly sync up. Uh, and then it says each city hosts at least one. Words like at least, again, a clear sign that you don't have perfect numerical um, delineation or distribution to it. It's not it's fixed. It's not one-to-one, -one, right? Yeah. Now, there is a numerical distribution that comes out of this. Uh, and, you know, we've said this before. Look for templates. Look for distributions. That five into six is really critical because one of the cities is being doubled. So the distribution that we end up with is two, one, 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 one. That is your five cities going into six spaces. One of the cities is doubled. That is immediately messier. Now you've got to track this second city. So if you go ahead and you put Tampa in the fall, it's you're not done with Tampa. Tampa's still floating out there like, hey, you can use me in the spring. And I'll be honest, that annoys me. I'm like, you suck. All those cities suck at that point to me because I'm like, you could all be doubled from, from what it looks like as you're going into it. And I don't want that. I want to say when you're used as a variable, you go away forever from me until the next question comes up. Then you can return. Yeah, at this point, the placement of something doesn't necessarily remove it from consideration. Uh, no city is going to host more than once per semester, so at least we can't have Tampa, you know, twice in the fall or twice in the spring or any of them. Yeah, which is good. That's good. Uh, and then there were three rules: the first two, and arguably even the third, conditional. And this is the first overt conditionality, the first like strict if then that we've really seen on the test, which I know for some people is another layer of difficulty or confusion. It is. Hmm. You want to go through the rules? Had, I don't know if you had more to add to that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So the first one is, um, the first two rules are ultimately pretty simple and similar, but here's what they were. If H is in the fall, then Montreal is also in the fall. I'm going to pause for a second and ask you a question that I know the answer to. Did you do this as a block? 
I did not. Yeah, that's the right answer. <laughs> a lot of people would, and what it would imply is that H and F have to go together. Yeah, so let's stop here because I wanted you to get to this first rule to talk about the conditionality in nature. Good. One of the things that came up is when people saw this as breaking out as fall and spring, they began to think that this was a two-value system game. That if you're not in you know, one, you're in the other. And that has some truth, but it doesn't mean that if you're in one, you're not in the other. So the contrapositives that you would typically think about taking, you can't. It doesn't work that way. When they say that if H is in fall, then M is in fall, it doesn't matter at that point. It is still possible for those variables to be doubled on the other side, at least one of them. And yeah. so you can't make a block out of it. This is not the true two-value system that we're used to seeing, and that is because of the doubling aspect of what's occurring. And this kind of adds into a point. I had said the other night in the crystal ball that this was not a numerical distribution game, but it does have an unusual numerical distribution. It's just a single unusual distribution, and you always have to track the numbers. We've done logic games section reviews before, and there's, I can't remember if it's November 2019 or which game section it is where it's just like, it's all numbers. It's like, if you don't track the numbers and follow them and just attack them, it's going to cause you lots of problems. So September in particular of last year was like yeah, that. That's which is why that test was a minus 13 scale. Is that game section beat people up if they weren't comfortable with numbers. Um, I'd make two points about this first rule. You've made one that the blocks don't work. Um, I would say that the blocks don't work because the conditional rules only go in one direction. A block seems to be uh, dual or, or like a biconditional. Yeah. So Honolulu in the fall does something, but Montreal in the fall doesn't. So if you could have one piece of that block and not necessarily the other, that makes a block a dangerous way to show it. Show this with an arrow. The second thing you said about the duality, the potential duality, and the contrapositive means normally Honolulu fall, Montreal fall. Oh, so then Montreal not fall, it must be in the spring, that kind yep. of thing. That's where you have to be careful with this. Because Montreal could be in the spring and not trigger this rule. That's exactly right. And that's where the two value system doesn't fly because of the duplication. Perfect. And so that's what I was saying is like, I showed it conditionally and then it was like, you can't make a contrapositive here. And that's the dangerous part of this game, yeah. at least from the starting point here is that. Yeah, you can't make the binary contrapositive. You could still say if Montreal's not in the fall, then Honolulu's not in the fall, but you can't then turn that to they must be in the spring kind of thing, or that yeah. the spring would do something. Yeah, you can't turn it from fall to spring. Exactly. That's a, really, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Perfect. So that was our first rule. What was the second rule? Well, if you could do the first rule, you're in good shape for two, uh, which is that Vancouver, Vancouver in the spring... <laughs> Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver in the spring, <laughs> then Tampa must also be in the spring. Same type of rule, really. Yeah, really the same thing, and all the same stuff applies. Don't show this with a block, use an arrow, be careful with the contrapositive, do slashes, but don't turn not spring into fall and vice versa. Cool, that's two out of three down. Um, in a way, I think the trickiest rule is the last. It's not hardly worded, but I think it's difficult to take the implications away, which is that in each semester, you've got either M or V or both. Paraphrasing. Okay. That's what it says. So to me, that was in each one of these, there was a minimum reservation for M slash V in each group. So when I looked at that, now, if you put M in fall, that didn't mean that suddenly Vancouver was out. It just meant that M satisfied that rule. Whereas if you took Vancouver away from the fall, then that would force Montreal to be used in, um, in that fall position. Mm -hmm. So you have to at least understand what it is. It's a minimum rule. One of the spaces is always reserved for M or V, but that does not preclude both of them from appearing in one of these uh, you know, fall or spring terms. Or in both. M could yeah. be your double. V could be your double. Um, if that's the case, then you've actually satisfied this. If you've got M in both, you're good, or V in both, you're good. Yeah. But obviously, that's going to work with some of you know the stuff that's going on here. But those conditional rules and the way they actually worked, and then that last rule, when I looked at this, my first thought was, you know what? Each of the, these terms, the fall and the spring, have three spaces. So we've got five total variables. There's not a huge margin here. So one of the things to kind of consider is, 
if you lose two cities for any purpose, if they go on the other side and those are the only ones that they have, the other three are going to have to fill in this particular period of time mm -hmm. in the semesters. And so that was kind of what I was thinking as I looked at, uh, you know, something like Montreal in the fall. I'm like, all right, if Montreal in the fall is not there, there's no way for Honolulu to be in the fall. That would be really powerful because that would force O, T, and V to have to be in the fall. And then I did the same kind of thing with T in the spring. And so that told me that both Montreal in the fall and Toronto in the spring, or Tampa, sorry, it should have been Toronto they chose. Sorry, Tampa. Oh. Uh, <laughs> the Tampa in the spring just wasn't going to happen. So that is a really powerful thing. That's where we can use the conditionality here and the five into three relationship on each of these semesters and realize that's actually a really thin margin when you have conditional rules. Extreme. When you have a thin margin for a group, look at necessary conditions. In this case, if you remove Montreal from the fall, you automatically know that OT and V are there. And if you remove Tampa from the spring, you know that H, M, and O are in the spring. That's useful. They're going to yeah. test that, obviously. Yeah, it's interesting, too. This is about the point in the section, setting this game up and starting to kind of begin to maneuver through the questions, that it occurred to me how many of these first three games, or really all of the first three games, how much of them depended on what I would call small, like choke points, small variable sets or positions. The first one had a block that could only go two spots. The next one had two, or really three groups of two, but restrictions on that. That's where your templates came from. In game two, this one's only got an either or, a left or right side, and only three positions in each. Yep. So there's a lot of twos and threes that we're starting to see here in these subgroupings, subdivisions. Yeah, and with That's only fantastic. five variables, yeah. you don't have and a lot of options. Only and five th things. Yeah, that, that scenario I was just talking about, they tested in the very first question. Mm -hmm. It's right out of the gate where they're like, oh, let's go ahead and take the necessary condition away from the fall uh, with Montreal. And they're testing you right out of the gate. So it's kind of like a prove it thing. Did you see it? Always keep in mind that in logic games, especially with grouping, that necessary conditions are really powerful because usually when you remove them, you remove the sufficient condition as well. And that takes two variables out of the mix. If there were 13 variables for six spaces, it's no big deal. Right. But if there's eight for five, or as in this case, five for three, the power of that is really magnified. This has got to be something that you have to think about when you're doing these games. I think it's a super valuable point that comes out of this discussion. Yeah, yeah, it's what can you afford to lose? And here you can't afford to lose much. Exactly. So after that, this game was a lot of like slogging through you know, conditions and just kind of like local questions where you're like, you're going through 13 and 16 and 17, you're just making scenarios and kind of following the rules. I felt pretty comfortable with it. I just felt that it was messier and more work than the first two games. And that's where my laziness comes in. I don't like <laughs> what, your, what your laziness did not prompt you to do was try templates here. Uh, and in that, we are in agreement. But we could have done it, double M, double V, or put M in fall and V in spring, or V in fall and M in spring, to satisfy that M and V rule. Yeah. And the reason I didn't do that is because I felt there was not enough other information. So you had you, you know, these five variables filling six spaces. In the last game, we had six variables filling six spaces. And you compare the two games. For me, game two is clearly a template game. Game three, I see how you can do it with four templates based upon the MV rule. The reason I didn't is because the other two rules aren't powerful enough to start pushing things around. It yeah. looked really open-ended to me. Yes, you'd get some information, but I could tell in game two you'd get a ton of information about uh, most of the templates. I didn't feel that way here, so I bypassed it. I like it. Yeah, there's really only the second rule from those templates might have done some stuff. Vancouver is a double. Vancouver in spring would have triggered something. It brought, I keep wanting to call it Tampa, or Toronto too. It would have brought Tampa with it. <laughs> but that's not enough for the whole of the, you know, the remaining spots that I would have pursued templates either. So. We're on the same page. Yes. Perfect. Let's go to game four. Well, let's turn the page. Woo. Ooh. The last game of the four. And after the city meetings game being third, hopefully you're still on track from a time standpoint and a little bit ahead. And you felt like that was a harder game. You know, I heard a lot of people complain about that game after the test, and I understand why they did. I don't think it's impossible, and I think if you make a lot of scenarios and you can work quickly that way, you can almost brute force it and kind of like force your way through here, and I think you're going to have to do a little bit of that no matter what. Then you get to the Festival Plays game, 
and there's more going on when we reach this particular stage. So let's take a look at what we have. And I remember when I started reading this game, laughing. And the reason is, I will read the plays to you. So there's eight, th you know, there's eight days, but there's only six plays. So the first thing you should notice is, well, if there's eight plays that are coming in a row and only eight days and only six plays, I got another numerical scenario I'm gonna have to deal with. This is six variables filling eight positions. We got to see what's going on with it. But here's our plays. Ghosts. All right. I'm sure it's not that Patrick Swayze, Demi Moore, you know, take because that was ghost. So I'm not sure I'd want to see that on the stage anyway. <laughs> <laughs> then Hap Good. All right. That's an interesting one. Jitney. All right. Loot. <laughs> Crime filler. And then suddenly, I guess the play organizer decided that they weren't being serious enough because they decided to close it out with Macbeth and Othello. So it was like, okay, we're just fooling around. Oh, guys, we got to make sure that we've got some serious plays in here. Let's get some Shakespeare going. <laughs> it seems like these Shakespeare plays are completely out of character with everything else. And that just made me laugh. This is one of those things where I was like, okay, putting myself in the position of that guy, it's weak. Weak choices, <laughs> yeah, it's, man. It's funny. Some of these do sound more like a Guy Ritchie film. Loot, Jitney. <laughs> I think Jitney's actually a play by uh, August Wilson. Really? Serves. Yeah. Um, fairly famous if you're into that sort of thing. But obviously then you get to Macbeth and Othello and things go to a different level. He's super famous, like Fences. He's really well known. So, Jessica. yes, M Macbeth and Othello. I appreciate Shakespeare. Watching Shakespearean plays isn't necessarily the top of my list. <laughs> so, some are better than others. But what about logic games with Shakespeare plays? How did you start to set this one up? Because... To me, the first thing that occurred to me is, well, my days of neat and tidy little small groups, five, six things to deal with, those are over. Yeah, now we're at eight days. So I was like, this is a linear game. I'm going to make the, uh, the eight. I knew it was unbalanced immediately. I knew that I didn't have enough variables. So the six into eight was something that was rather critical because I needed to see how they were going to multiply one or more plays in this game to see if we had, we're going to have a real numerical distribution. So my first thought was, this is going to have several different distributions that are going to affect what occurs. That is not what happens, though. And that's, so let's take a look at the rules then. Yeah, six and eight. Here's the first rule is um, it basically just uh, makes an equivalence between two days. Play on one and the play on day five have to be the same. Yep. And then they do it again. Yeah. You get it again in rule two for days two and seven. has to be the same play. So, again, pausing for a second to think numerically. We knew we had six and eight. We knew potentially there was going to be two of these six that get used again. At least we know where they are. We don't know what they are. Might be a couple of lutes or a couple of fellows, but we know where the duplications exist. One and five, two and seven. Yeah, so that is actually two plays being doubled. We had six into eight. We needed two extra. There it is. We now know that we are in a two, two, one, 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 et cetera, distribution here of the six plays into the eight days. So at that point, with just like it was with the third game, it has an unusual non-standard distribution, but it, I know what it is and there's only a single one of it. I will say that these first two rules, I saw some people misunderstand the way this worked. You, you use the word equivalence, and I think that's a good way of actually putting it. What it means is, is that if you are in one, then you're in five. And if you're in five, you're in one. It's always the same variable. So if you know that a variable is in one of those two, it's in the other. You also know that, that if a variable is not in one of those two, then it is not in the other. It can't be. Yeah, whoever's in three is a single. Yeah, so you show up in one, you teleport to five immediately, <laughs> and vice versa. Same with two and seven. You clone into five, and yeah, two and seven. Yeah, those are basically cloned blocks in each position. Whatever plays in one is also in five, and that helps on the flip side, because whatever's not in that is not in the other one. So that's something that I've seen that was misunderstood, and that's unfortunate because it's the kind of thing where if you were to put this in uh, arrow diagram form, this would be a double arrow is what this would be. So it is always going to be the same, and it doesn't matter that it's, it starts at one or it starts at five or whether it starts at two or starts at seven. It goes both ways. Yeah. Unlike the conditional stuff in the last game, this truly is biconditional. This is that block idea, in effect. I used an equal sign, but it's just because I'm a nonconformist. It works. Yeah. 
Rule three, the two Shakespeare plays here, Macbeth and Othello, cannot be performed on consecutive days. Doesn't give an order, just gives a not block. Yeah, so it's either not M-O or not O-M. This is probably the first smart choice by this, uh, you know, festival director. I was going to say, I bet this is this makes you happy because <laughs> it was like you would destroy the audience two nights in a row. Like, no, you get a day man, off. I can't do Shakespeare back to back. That's a little rough. <laughs> but this doesn't, unfortunately, do anything into your diagram itself, or at least I didn't see that it would. Not yet. You couldn't be like, oh, so then M can't be first, or O has to be third. There wasn't anything like that to draw from this. The only good thing here about this rule is that if one of these guys gets doubled, they're going to knock the other one out of a bunch of spaces. So that was the first thing that I thought about is like, if O or M appears anywhere in one, two, five, or seven, it's going to restrict the other one from more than just a single space. It's going to knock it out of, say, uh, three or four spaces, depending upon, you know, which placement we actually have here. Yeah, you could start to see how that would work. If M's in two... Well, then O can't be in 1, which means O can't be in 5. And M must be in 7, so O can't be in 4. O can't be in 6. Like, there's all kinds of little things that would start to happen here. But as I say about knot blocks, typically, and I know you do too, they tend not to matter until a piece of the components are in place. And in yeah. this case, putting something in place can have a doubling effect. So, Yeah, knot block is not the, not the first place to go, but it often comes in at the end of questions when you've got something already on the board and you're trying to figure it out. Yeah, or forces you to leave enough space to keep people away from each other. Uh, in this case, Shakespeare. So, rule four. Yep. For at least one performance, and this is uh, kind of nasty, for at least one performance of Hapgood, H, the next play is Macbeth. You know how and I feel about this kind of stuff immediately. I, well, I mean, I'm, I can guess your body language right now. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as first of all, there's five rules here, so we're getting a little a few more rules than we saw in some of the other games, and it starts off for at least one. Ah, man, I don't want to see that. That's open ended and messy right there. This is what I don't want to see in games. As we just talked about games one and two, it was sweet and clean. Sweet. This is not. And you take a look at this. It's just for one performance of H somewhere. And if, you know, depends upon what's happening, there's going to have to be an HM block, all right? We know H has to be used, but if H is doubled, only one of the two would require M behind it. So you have to realize that this is very open-ended and it means that you can put place H or M and it doesn't mean that they are done for. They're, that doubling is still in play for both of them. So... I don't like that. I, it's not an easy rule to kind of like diagram out. I just put an H arrow, HM, at least one on it. It's kind of like a little sub notation. So it's like something similar. Yeah, yeah. My instinct here was to try to go put some not laws in, but you can't. M could be first and then go after H somewhere else. H could be last and come before M. Somewhere yeah, else. just on the basis of this rule that we're saying, you couldn't exactly. make uh, not laws. You can actually do it uh, with the next rule. But uh, we'll, yeah, see, not, we'll see that in a minute, because H is going to get knocked done. out of one. Exactly. Uh, and there's the last rule. Finally. There's a performance of J uh, at some time before there's any performance. I like that better, of Hapgood. So there's a J before any H. Yeah. I hate this rule, though. Because it's so... <laughs> you have to read it very carefully and understand what it is saying. Because when I look at this, it says there must be a performance of J that is at some time before there is any performance of H. So before H shows up, there has to be J ahead of H. However, this allows for J to then appear again after H. Yeah. So a sequence where J is ahead of H and then H is also ahead of J, there's a second J that's after it, that is acceptable. But wherever H is... There's going to have to be a J in front of the first one that is there. And that means that H can't be first. So it wasn't the last rule that knocked H out of first. This is the one that knocks H out of first. And of course, if you can't be in first, you can't be in fifth. And so H gets knocked out of there as well. Yeah, it wasn't the prior rule. It is the last rule, this being the last rule. But yeah, people get it. No, you mentioned you were talking about... I knew, I knew what you meant. Yeah, um, you were talking about just, the fourth rule. Yeah, you and I visualize this stuff pretty well. I want to make sure people listening to it know what the hell we're talking about. 
the the last two rules though in this game are turned completely on their head simply by the fact that there's uncertainty with numbers or that you've got these two additional repeating pieces. I yep. don't know what they are. Super annoying. Uh, <laughs> I agree. When I ran into it, I was like, rule, there's another rule. Uh, and I didn't hate the first two rules. I was like, these are really nice. They're tightening up the game. They're giving me that 2-2, 1-1-1, one, 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 et cetera, distribution. I liked it. And then when I got to the last couple of rules, I was like, I can live with Macbeth and Othello being separated. That struck me as a wise decision in general. But the last two, I was like, this is going to require focus. I can't just lazily roll through the questions. I want to have to actually like count out variables and make sure that I'm watching at all times that I get an HM block somewhere and that J is always ahead of H. So something that, you know, that really forces you to be quite careful with what you're doing. It is interesting though, because like when you look at these doubled variables with one and five and two and seven, it means that if a variable gets placed elsewhere, like three, four, six, and eight, that's a single use variable. So if you put one of the variables in eight, you're not going to be doubling it. So just kind of keep in mind how that game works because that can cause some type of restrictions. Like can J be eighth, for example? That's going to be tough because that's the only usage of it. And we know from this rule here that J's always got to appear sometime before H. So that's not going to work out. And that's not exactly obvious on the surface. You have to stop and think about what's happening with the numerical distribution here. Right. And I think that's kind of like a tough thing to to absorb at speed when you're already dealing with some messy rules here. But watch those two doublings because everything else is used a single time, and that can help eliminate some possibilities for what you're looking at in terms of variable placement. Yeah, that eighth position was was interesting. Um, I didn't have this as an inference, but as we're talking about it now, and the wheels are turning, it seems like M couldn't go in eighth as well either. Because that would be M's only usage. There'd have to be an H in front of it. I don't know, sorry, that would put H and 2 and 7. We'd be H okay. and 2 and 7 would be okay. Yeah, that's okay. I'm thinking H and 1 from the last rule. This is why you should write <laughs> things down, people. <laughs> or not do them on the fly. Or not, yeah, do them in your head on the fly. Um, on tape, by the way. Brilliant. But, it's good, though. It, it's memorialized you making an oh, error. So mistake. I will, of course, write this down. And then every time you irritate me in the future, I will be like, do you remember... At the one hour and whatever mark this is. November 3rd. It's podcast uh, so. 70. <laughs> Never forget. I remember. Never forget. <laughs> the day it will live in infamy for all the wrong reasons, me making mistakes. Uh, but this game on the whole, I, I had the same, I think, probably reaction to it, which was one of just annoyance. I was like, come on. But it was bound to happen. And I think that's the only redeeming part of this for me was I was like, at least I saw this coming. You knew it was going to get increasing difficulty in three and four yeah. uh, after the first two games being so clean. But I think this is kind of cool because as a section and you break it down and you talk through it, we can see the difficulty here. We can see how people complained about the city meetings and the festival plays, the third and fourth games, and we understand why they felt they were more difficult. They yeah. were. They weren't wrong. Yeah. It, it's just fortunate that we can look at this and say, now that we have it, this also wasn't a devastating destroyer section where there was multiple incredibly hard games or one really super hard shredding game. So I think that's a real positive for those of you who had this section. Hopefully if you did if, and you took the, the actual test, you did really well on it. If you've done this as a practice test, use this and learn from it. Think about what we're talking about from a strategic standpoint because we're not saying you should have every thought exactly the same as we do. We don't even agree ourselves sometimes on the best way to approach certain things. But some of the stuff that we've talked about should be echoing through your head when you're looking at this because there are little tips that we're putting out there. Hey, watch the necessary condition in grouping games. Things like that where it's like that can be a real game changer during a single game that for other people might be really hard. And then you're like, I saw the key. This is the back door that unlocks everything. It's little things like that that we're looking for. That 2-2 two, two kind of doubling, meaning everybody else is a single usage. That's kind of powerful when you look at those rules and the way they're constructed in that fourth game. Yeah, the numbers here are really powerful. I meant that M can't go in six. I just misspoke. I wasn't wrong. Okay. Because that would put H into five, and that makes H go into one, and that can't happen. So I'll be erasing this correction from the podcast. <laughs> 
<laughs> you're not allowed to, <laughs> to correct. Well, and, you know, again, make sure that you get all the rules <laughs> straight in this. Because when I talked about like how with one and five and two and seven, if you can't be in one of those, like H can't be in one, we know H can't be in five. They test that later on. I think it's question 22 right near the end where they say, you know, if Macbeth is on, uh, it performed on the second day. Well, that means Macbeth's on two and seven. That immediately eliminates O from one and three and... um you know, a couple others. Yeah, and so and eight. it forces O into just a single position. And it's not something that you might necessarily immediately see, but it's the consequence of the doubling and the way that actually works. So take a look at things like that because this is kind of concepts they rotate constantly in and out of logic games. Yeah. Would that put O in four? Yeah. Really, that's exactly what happens to it. I'm back, baby. I got it. <laughs> Take me a second. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a really... Uh, solid section. I wouldn't say it was exciting to me. Uh, I certainly think that as far as like standard template type games that one and two are great to study and, you know, figure out whether or not you'd make that decision. I would make the same decision on game two to show the four templates all day long. I'm with you on that. So, you know, it, it, doing logic games is not so much about to me how you did on the games during your practice until you reach the point of doing the LSAT. It's what did you learn from it that you can use the next time you encounter something similar. I think there's some good lessons here. I don't think it's the most exciting section. It's certainly not extraordinarily unique or even all that unique, but there's some learnable points in here that can make you a better test taker the next time you go out. 100%. And let's not forget the fact it's also the most recent thing that exists. So if Indeed. for no other reason than just my primacy or something, this is a thing to do before you go and take your next LSAT because it's the last thing that they have publicized and that has been tested as a real flex. So, yeah, I mean, value aside, potential, call it like representativeness or prediction aside, I just I think this is worth doing simply because it exists now. 100% agreement. Any other comments? No, no, I'm going to go see if I can stir another martini and not turn on the television tonight. <laughs> and they're not going to be able to decide it tonight anyway. I've got, I've got it in the back. They don't, they Who's don't, holding not, this up? Is it Pennsylvania? Is it my fine friends Nevada. in Atlanta? Nevada. Nevada. That'll Classic. be a problem. They said earlier today they would not release any results until tomorrow, which I was like, don't do that. That's suspicious. Um, but that's one of the states that's going to end up being apparently decisive now that certain states like Michigan and Wisconsin have been called uh, for Biden. So we won't know, at least for a little bit longer, what the situation is, but it certainly looks go. interesting out there. All right. Well, yeah, this is going to come out right along the same time as the podcast or the blog does on some of this May stuff. So if anybody's listening to this and hasn't read the blog, go check that out as well. I think it'll give you some insights into how test how this test was built. Yeah, and if you are taking the November test this weekend, good luck. Go in there, be positive, feel good. John and I will be floating around in the social media sphere, uh, keeping an eye on things, and then we'll recap that test probably at the end of next week. Hopefully, it's a nice, fair test. Hopefully, they use some of the tests that we talked about in the crystal ball as being very possible candidates for and, November, and, and if not November, the later LSATs like January and so on. All right, on that note, let's call it a night, John. Let's if you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it. And if you enjoyed it, please leave us a comment and rating. And if you have any questions, please send those to lsatpodcast at powerscore.com. We do occasional mailbag episodes, and I'm sure there's one coming up on the horizon at some point here. Last, if you get a chance, join me in the middle of November for Secrets of the Law School admissions process, which is a live webinar that I'm going to do. Maybe John will join me. Maybe I'll guilt him into it. Or maybe he'll just <sighs> sit on his couch at home. We'll see. I believe that is November 17th, is it, that it is coming up? It is on I'll, our... I'll find out and be there. <laughs> it, that You could sign up for that for free. It's at powerscore.com forward slash free seminars as one word. I'll be doing that. I think it's going to be pretty interesting. So join me if you get an opportunity. But otherwise, on that note, next time we talk, we should have a president, hopefully. And uh, hopefully there's been no rioting or any further uh, civil unrest over the election, at least. So, John, take care of yourself. Everybody out there, be safe. We'll talk to you soon.